The Duende Project is a collaboration between Tony Brown, veteran performance poet, and Stephen Lanning Cafaro, bassist and guitarist. Tony has been writing for over 40 years. He published his first poem at the age of nine in the Highlights magazine. And then he had the good fortune of a student teacher who was a poet who introduced him to poets such as Galway Cannell and Robert Bly and Etheridge Knight. And he said that's what sealed it for him to stay with poetry. And he has kept writing and since that first poem and has been a three-time Pushcart Prize nominee, his work has appeared in many journals and anthologies, and he's traveled all over the country and slammed for the Worcester Poets Asylum and written for Got Poetry. And he's all, Tony has also hosted a number of reading series in New England, and when I asked for a most interesting moment, he noted, I've seen some amazing poems and moments of community hosting a reading which featured Dennis Brutus, who was incarcerated with Nancy Nelson Mandela, comes to mind. And Tony also noted that as he became connected to poetry, it was about the same time that he also began playing music and uh, loving music. And he, it was no surprise that the two came together when he met Stephen who has been featured bassist for many bands in New England, is an acclaimed bass teacher, virtuoso player of 4.5 and 6, 4, 5, and 6 string <laughs> electric bass, an accomplished nylon string jazz guitarist, and developing upright bassist as well. And so the Duende Project got together about five years ago, and they've been performing up and down the East Coast, and they have opened for other performers such as Lori Anderson a few years ago, and they have released their own Tony collections of their work. And when asked why I share poetry out loud, Tony said, I think it is at heart the only way to truly get most poems. All those devices of alliteration, rhyme, etc., only come fully alive when you know it's live. So we're looking forward to the live program that the Duende Project have for us this morning. I'd like to ask you to please give them a warm welcome up. Duende Project. Destiny shifts a bit to the right. You're just a little less the same. You have to crab walk through the star tide. It's making you see things a little differently. It's like finding out you're adopted. It's like being a ventriloquist's dummy. All the animals in the sky are crying. Your houses miss you. Yet still, you like what's in the mirror well enough. The night sky doesn't show up there. That's the same old you there. That's no crumbling cookie. Wobbly earth is so disconcerting. Maybe if you sleep, it will stop. Maybe in the morning it will have stopped moving. Maybe you'll see the zodiac discarded on your lawn. Maybe you'll pick it up and stow it in the garage. Hide it behind the packed up tent till summer. Maybe you'll forget about it till the next time you go camping. You'll find it. You'll 
try to remember what it is. And you'll put it aside to consider when you get home. And you're lying out there under the stars. You won't even think about it. power. Um, we have this motto about doing things that scare us on stage. Our last album was called One Thing That Scares You, as a matter of fact, and it was all about the idea of you should always be out there striving to be a little frightened of your art when you're doing stuff. And one of the frightening things that I do on a regular basis is actually put on a guitar when I'm standing on stage with him. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're going to continue with a piece uh, we've been doing for a long time, but uh, just recently they forced me to start doing this, so here you go. This is called, um, it's called Do It Yourself. That's better. Why didn't you tell me it was out of tune? Ah, much better. She burns sage at the root of her favorite tree and calls herself priest. town they call her other things much much worse because she dares to love who and what and where she wants on the nights of the full moon the men and the women of the small town come out in these circular stucco walls there's something in there that they need over in front of the white church on the green green lawn right under the nose of the fat pastor she dances without bending a blade of grass because God finds her agreeable over there in front of the frat house Two men kiss. The dangerous drunken boys inside see it and decide to do nothing this time. And that's a start. Two have begun to feel comfortable making public their own sacrament of the infinite. And my grandmother sniffs. Elderly is such a spindly word. The legs of that word do not begin to support me. She traded in her typewriter two years ago for a laptop and writes the definitive poetry of our time between the innings of Cubs games. And she won't stop smoking. Ever. Swears that if she gets to heaven to find the clouds have been posted, she'll find another place to light up. Friends. Beloved friends. The arms of God are nearly endless. All it's asked of you is that you take yourself like a finger on that vast hand and 
and touch this earth and take what you feel back to the heart. So make a life or make a living. Make love or make art. Adorn this world with the work of your soul, but do it yourself because no one will do it for you. point of view of a guy who's kind of a jerk. <clears throat> but aren't we all? <laughs> oh, you are beautiful. Though in no conventional sense. And yes, the word is overused, but occasionally correct. As in full with it spilling over your edges and into the street. I can see dictatorships dissolving in your wake as you pass through those gray and dingy capitals of pain. The people rising up pastel behind you, their leaders bowing to pressure, opening gates and secret files. Domestic spies throwing up their hands and flinging headphones to the floor. Questioning the rationale for listening in on drab conversations when you are possible. And you still walking, oblivious to what's happening. Serene and humble and not even noting the turmoil that you cause. The drama. The financial panic. You can't even see the bankers with fistfuls of fraud trying to buy a glance from you. You don't see the drug dealers kneeling and begging their marks to try the addiction they can satisfy. The warriors gnashing armor and wailing missiles at each other regardless of uniform just to gain the ground where you might pass. And all the time, you think you're nothing. Ordinary as shattered silk, wasted as a second chance. All the time you're spilling over and the world slips on what you leave. And most of all, in the roar, tumult, steady chaos, and all the following, general, disbelief that you are walking among us. You don't even think of me. So this next piece, uh, this next piece, okay, so we have this little tiny origami swan. And when Cheryl mentioned it, I was like, yes. perfect. Because this next piece is about origami. Kinda, sorta. Um, and uh, I, I wanna tell you right, right up front what it is. Is I'm a, I'm a on the political scale, I'm, um, I'm sort of left of left. And, uh, no, I'm really left of left. And, um, I get real tired of people um, abdicating the responsibility for being patriotic to the right. Like, my views are not about patriotism when they're really about trying to make the country 
as best as it can possibly be, which I think is about as patriotic as you can get, frankly. It's my own personal view. Um, so I said, you know, there's just not an awful lot of patriotic work for leftists out there. Voila. <laughs> This is, called, this is called Where Do You Live? It was my sister-in-law's idea, I swear, <laughs> to hire an origami artist for Martha's birthday party. And I expected the kids to be bored. But Yumiko's fingers snared all of us as they delicately spidered upon the paper began to fold life into three dimensions from two, taking us through a door into a place where you can build without cutting, where there's no need for a slot A to hold tab A. She said it takes great peace of mind to learn to do this well, and she told us that in Hiroshima once a year, Thousands of people fold small paper boats at each boat on a river with a candle inside and they let them drift and burn for peace. Where are you from, I asked her. Are you from there? And she said, I was from there once, but now I am from America. Where are you from? And I would have liked to tell you, Miko, that I'm from America too, but I fear that I'm instead from a place where origami comes to die at the hands of market forces that turn culture and tradition into a source for party tricks. I would have liked to tell her that I live all my time in America, but the truth is I live most of my time in the United States. Because here we have two countries which exist simultaneously on one geography. Here's the US of radio that's designed by the moneyed calculus of bleating repetition. And here's the America of the gospel choir that shouts for splendor even as the mob burns their church around them. This is the U.S. of terrific missiles and cars as large as our shrinking sense of control. And this is the America of outsider art, free jazz and small mercies shown to the smallest and strangest of us. This is the U.S. of sweet plastic that's ignited and burned through all the easy answers. The land of the fire that's begun to lick at the edges of the America of red sandstone, deep woods, wide rivers. The America where we always remember that we're all descended from someone, somewhere, who burned. The place where we care about those who've been burned, who are being burned. Where we pray we can be forgiven by those we've burned. Pray that we can all make ourselves whole by making our common home among the folds and creases of a single idea that we created the United States as a launching pad toward America, and if we don't like the footing it gives us, we can always change it. But it did seem to me, after that one red second had passed, that it was too much to ask a paper crane folded for entertainment at a child's birthday party to balance all this weight. Even though people come here all the time to balance their dreams on our old paper. And there are people in Japan who annually load the fate of the world onto burning paper boats. So instead, I told Yumiko, I'm from right here too. And at least for that moment, was true. And soon enough, a dozen cranes were on that table. And Yumiko showed us how a tug on the tail set the wings in motion. And the children were hushed as they handled each one and tried it for themselves. And soon enough, small, important, Lights were beginning all around the backyard.
We have uh, more time than we expected, so uh, we're going to do one more for you. This is a little piece I wrote for uh, my girlfriend and for a very close friend of mine named Mike McGee. And uh, we'll leave you with this. This is called Rest and Thank You. Rough daily struggle has ended. When it comes time to rest at last, nothing can beat laughing at adult swim. Late into the night, on a worn couch, with my lover and my cat sleeping beside me. morning I will ease my aging, fattened, slothful frame back to the battle. I'll speak lovingly with a close friend and imagine myself strong and positive. Drink pots of coffee and proclaim that every day will come up stunning and miraculous from here on in. You know, Acting as if that were true, and admitting that it might be, speeds me through the dark, laughing, and strung out on hope. <laughs> 23 seconds left to spare, we did it. We're the Duende Project. I'm Tony Brown. Stephen Lanning Cafaro. Thank you. To take the wrong road is to arrive at the snow. And to arrive at the snow is to get down on all fours for 20 centuries and eat the grasses of the cemeteries. To take the wrong road is to arrive at woman, woman who isn't afraid of light, Woman who murders two roosters in one second. Light which isn't afraid of roosters, and roosters who don't know how to sing on top of the snow. But if the snow truly takes the wrong road, then it might, need, it might meet the southern wind. And since the air cares nothing for groans, we will have to get down on all fours again and eat the grasses of the cemeteries. I saw two mournful wheat heads made of wax, burying a countryside of volcanoes, and I saw two insane little boys who wept as they leaned on a murderer's eyeballs. But two has never been a number, because it's only an anguish and its shadow. It's only a guitar where love feels how hopeless it is. It's the proof of someone else's infinity, and the walls around a dead man, and the scourging of a new resurrection that will never end. Dead people hate the number two, but the number two makes women drop off to sleep. And since women are afraid of light, light shudders when it has, no, when it has to face the roosters. And since all roosters know is how to fly over the snow, we will have to get down on all fours and eat the grasses of the cemeteries forever. Thank you. A kid with a can of pop cutting across a lawn, a park, was jumped, was stopped, was asked, by whose authority do you invade this grass? Traveling on. Trayvon's mama rises up in the dark, grips my shoulders, searches for a spark of her son. I will look in my dream, I dream, but she shrugs away keening trials go on. We used to say a hood and meant a boy who could hurt you bad. A hood is a fine tradition in cloth. You're hooded for knowledge or wizardry. Executioners wear it. Try it on. We cut down our children. We burn them like weeds. We don't want them cutting across our lawn like Trayvon. Trayvon is unbodied. Now no one can touch him 
or buy him a drink, or blow him a kiss. He's lost with the others, cut down like saplings. They're gone. Fresh fallen snow, sparkling wonder, silent celebration. Wind blown, turbulent changes gather together. Blinding blizzard, white deluge, challenging realities. Bridget's Day proclaims movement to Equinox, brightly lit path. Snow softly covers earth, home fires burning bright, love blankets. Long winter shadows hide the little people songs, joyful gifts. Moonbeams kiss bare trees. Ice mirrors blink, endless truth. Snow melts, water flows, impermanence Rains. Happy winter. <laughs>